Okay. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May I have attention, please? All quiet, please. Thank you. Go ahead, have your notes out. We're continuing on with Nicaragua, and we'll be looking at um, Central America um, in the Cold War. Um, by the way, I handed back some things to some folks um, who had already known that there is extra points available in retaking quizzes, um, and I've officially put that into Google Classroom. So yesterday I was putting all kinds of opportunities in Google Classroom out there for students to pick up some additional points. Um, and you'll notice for the tests that you guys had, I want to say there's like a 20% um, opportunity to pick up some points there. So particularly if you're looking at this, the point value for the semester, you guys can figure this out. If you're like sitting at like, um, like a really low B, I don't know if there's going to be enough points to get that up to an A, but if you're like at a, at a high B or high B, there may, check the numbers, you do the calculations, there may be opportunities for you to get some stuff turned in to me before next week Wednesday. As far as stuff in here, there's no more big grades. In fact, I don't even think there's any more small grades. I'll do a, um, a feedback form that'll work for like five points toward the very end of the semester, but um, other than that, um, if you want to, you can try and pick up some points by doing like the essays. Um, okay, so is that, is that fairly clear? Yeah. We've only got like today, Thursday, Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, we're already started this unit. We're going to be carrying it into um, second semester. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm still waiting for a couple people to take their test. Okay, yeah. So that is going on. Yeah, some people who are like the in-class learners, but I haven't seen them. Yeah, it's kind of like when I had the, um, uh, there was a lot of 10th graders and uh, boys basketball team that were in quarantine, and they're like, oh, we don't have to take the test. If you're officially at home, then there's a different assessment if you're, in class, then even if you're gone, we'll have that assessment ready for you when you come back. Okay? But don't worry yourself about that. All right. Questions, comments? Any of those point value types of things and so forth? Because as I was putting those in there, it was already making a difference. So, like, I'm sure some people are like, oh, huh, I'm glad I got those points because it bumped it up from one grade level up to the next. And that's where you need to be. At the end of the semester, Ashton, do you want to be just short of the grade you want? or safely into the grade you want. Whatever. You have already given, and I've already put in the point values that you had for the IAs. I'm still going through the junior ones, but you don't have to worry about that. Okay? So if you've got your IA into me and the final and so forth, it's in there for the semester grade. Yeah, I think I'm going to be going and contacting just a couple of few people as far as like some uh, remediable types of things for, I, for IB's purposes because, yeah. Yeah, we'll work on that for the word count thing. Okay? Oh, it's not exactly. I think I, I raised the bar a little bit because like... Yeah, I mean, if you want to roughly, it's going to be, see, the, mine was a 100-point scale, and the IB's is a 25-point scale. It's not completely dead-on accurate, but if you just divide it by four, that will give you a, a sense of what it would be. But I'm not going to put that out officially to you guys, okay? Because, in fact, one of the things, like, a student might give me, a, like, a really good section one, section two, section three, but section one and section two maybe have 2,200 words, and so officially IB wouldn't give any points to section three. So that's why, yeah, we'll need to fix that up. Other questions, comments? Okay. All right. Uh, I'm continually watching the news, so hopefully we'll have a relatively calm week in this country. <laughs> and uh, next Wednesday is the inauguration. And actually, Biden has already said, you know, it's okay. You, you can watch it on the television screen. Uh, for security's sake, there are, I think they've closed down the mall, uh, anticipating, because, you know, I mean, people can peacefully, peacefully protest, but I think there's a bit more concern 
uh, based on what transpired last week. And so just trying to kind of keep this thing growing through. We want security. <laughs> we also want a constitution. And we want the protection of people's free assembly and free speech and things like that. And that is, that is concerning. Because sometimes, I mean, you've seen it in American history. Oh my gosh, we're in the Cold War. What should we do with the rights of people to speak out in favor of like left-wing ideologies? At times, we've done like whole Red Scare kind of things and just, you know. And then we're like, whoa, wait a minute. That's not so good for democracy that we're like not advancing human rights and free speech and things like that. No, oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like, yeah, it's like the, the one guy, he had the stroke, and he was in there, it's like, oh, yeah, all those guys, and realize they were all bad people. And then they just had, this should have hit you, like the guitarist, you know, and his wife was on there, his widow was on there, talking about how they broke his hands, and they bloodied him, and beat him, and killed him, and you're like, wait a minute, we're supposed to be good guys. Anyway, yeah. That was the House of Representatives that's in the, uh, the Democrats in the House are mad. And there's a lot of people who are pretty mad. And so they're kind of like, what should we do? And then it's kind of like, oh, my gosh, it, it's, a, it's a challenge. Because, like, what do you do when you got be sitting? And you got a little kid and you got them for one half hour more. And they do something really bad. And you're thinking, what if I just ignore it? Maybe hand it off in a half an hour and be – or – Lay down the law with a half an hour, and you can, you're going to get some blowback. Because, I mean, when, you get, when you're dealing with somebody that's not behaving correctly, you can get some blowback and so forth. So there's this debate of, like, if, if the people who are really upset with what happened last week um, get too, t too tough, then, you know, they're going to get some blowback, and that could be avoidable. Although other people are like, well, then you just ignore it then you're sending out a message that it was okay. Take your pick, all right? I mean, I, I use the, the, the babysitter analogy, but I don't think it's completely uh, off balance. Because, you know, if you're playing a game with a little kid and they lose and they throw a tantrum, what's that? Yeah, so I mean, it's like, I don't know. Hopefully, everything will be okay. Oh yeah, I mean, it's I mean, stuff matters because I, I've known this because like you get students. I mean, I've seen this over the years and so forth. You get students and some students misbehave, and the teacher cracks down on the student, and then the other students are like, "Well, that was too much." And then there's you get like this whole rebellion going on. Like, oh my gosh. Anyway, so it's drama, it's life, and there's all these different things that are going on. All right, so you guys ready to dive back into this? Okay, so what we saw last time was, Jackson, who won in Nicaragua ultimately? This is actually, I mean, it's kind of like you could give me either answer. Did the Sandinistas win or did the Contras win? Would a correct answer be both? Yeah, I mean... The Contras fought the Sandinistas to the negotiating table, so the Sandinistas had to sign on to free and fair elections. Raise your hand if you can tell me, what was one critical military component of the Contras, helped by the United States, that drove the Sandinistas to the negotiating table and allowed for free and fair elections? Yeah, the mines in the harbor, yeah, which cut off Nicaraguan trade. So the Sandinistas are like, okay, we're going to take a chance, you know. And this woman was elected, Violeta de Chamara. She was the editor's w widow, yeah. And the editor, was he a Sandinista or, no, he wasn't a Sandinista. Yeah, he was, he was against Somoza's regime, or at least he was critical of Somoza's regime. Would he also be critical of, like, I don't know, Sandinista's fundraising tactics, like, <laughs> like um, uh, kidnapping people? Yeah, I mean, so he's, like, trying to be this objective, you know, but Somoza's regime didn't like him, so they had him killed. So she inherited from him, and then I'm sure she collected a lot of respect on her own right, and she's elected president. So what does that mean for the future, Tara, of the Sandinistas in electoral politics in Nicaragua? Can they ever win again? 
Yeah, they did. Yeah, I mean, this guy was back in there. He's like, I'm for democracy now. I mean, my gosh, can you be like a leader of a military effort and so forth and ultimately be a big proponent of democracy? I suppose. It helps if you win, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm in favor of democracy when I win. The <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should be in favor of democracy all along. Now, I'm going to play a couple of clips for you because one of the students uh, several years ago was like, Mr. Hanson, this is a great video from Family Guy. I'm like, oh, what does it deal with? It deals with the Ollie North story, and this is sort of like an American thing. Oliver North, former Marine, uh, maybe he wasn't this at the same time, he was working in the White House. You got that in your notes? Oliver North worked in the White House. Um, he was in charge of kind of dealing with the whole Contras thing and helping the Contras. Could we just send money to the Contras throughout Reagan's presidency? No. no. Legally, could we? What was something that was in the way? The Boland Amendment. When you think of Boland Amendment, think of it as like an amendment to an appropriations bill that was already going through Congress and so forth that said, we're not supposed to send money to the Contras in the form of military and it's sometimes in the form of anything, whether medical or food or anything. So did, <laughs> did we kind of get around it at times? Yeah. Or excuse me, did people within the White House get around it? Yeah, and Oliver North did that. And the weird thing was, some of the money that went to the Contras came from a really strange source. Frank, do you remember the really strange source of where did Oliver North get hold of some cash? If you don't know, it's okay, because this was like one of the weirdest things in the whole thing. Where did he get that cash that he secretly sent on to the Contras? Because apparently the Contras were not raising enough money selling illegal drugs. Uh, or collecting enough money on like, you know, 53 cents a day will support a Nicaraguan freedom fighter. I think you're probably saying something about Yeah. I remember. What country did we get that money from? Exactly, Iran. Where did we get? He's got it. How did we get money from Iran, which we hated? What, did we sell something to them? Exactly, weapons that they needed in their fight. Okay? And what did we get in exchange besides you know, this selling opportunity? The Iranians had among their people control of U.S. individuals who were being held hostage. So it was really messed up, very messed up. So when that, came, when that hit the fan, you can write this down. There was all kinds of investigations. There were Senate hearings, and people were like, oh my gosh, this is going to be terrible. Reagan, for his right, went on television, and he's like, yeah, I really messed up on this one. He took the blame. He didn't quit. And there, you know, there were some people who were like, oh, maybe you should quit, and so forth. And other people were like, well, he took the blame. And basically what he, did, what he said was, I should have kept a closer eye on what was going on in the White House. Do you understand that? I should have kept a closer eye on what was going on. I didn't actually ask for this, but it still had happened under my watch. Oliver North was in my White House, and he shouldn't have done that, and he did, and so therefore, my bad. And so they had hearings, and of course, Oliver North is coming out defending the Contras and defending what the United States did and so forth. And then when they had a trial, he was acquitted. So he didn't go to prison. So where is he today? He's alive. Are there any people who would go, yeah, what he did was like, you know, for the good guys, standing up to those gosh darn communists, and we should have been able to give money to them. Sure, yeah, I mean, there's going to be some Americans who would be like, yeah, that's fine, so forth. So it was kind of weird. It didn't all go badly against him. And of course, some of the evidence, it was interesting, there'll be a reference in this cartoon, to Fawn Hall. Do you remember Fawn Hall? Fawn Hall was his personal secretary, and right before... Uh, government authorities were like able to get hold of all of the uh, written evidence within Oliver North's office. She like destroyed it under Oliver North's or orders. Actually, she destroyed some of it, ground it all up, and others she stuck into her big old boots and walked out of the office. And so, anyway, it was interesting. Yeah, I mean, but eventually the cover-up blew up and people are, you know, but how many people went to jail from it? I don't know that too many people. Oliver North didn't. So I'll play this cartoon for you. It's silly, but it gives you a little bit of a context of, wow, in America sometimes you're a scandal 
but other for other people you're a hero. I can't believe you kids don't know about the great patriot Holly North. In the 80s there was no Oh dear. <laughs> I think you were right. No, they won't. Crazy. Have you ever seen this? Crap, that's the end. Wow, I just learned why I was being entertained. Wow, oh, sorry. I was like entertained. One of the things that's fascinating, if you look at this, um, Red Dawn came out. And Jennifer Grey was in it. Uh, nobody puts uh, baby in a corner, right? If you know that from Dirty Dancing, is that the one? She was in that, yeah. Yeah, she was in that. And then, of course, um, Charlie Sheen was in this, and Patrick Swayze is in this movie. And of course, the premise is Red Dawn. Here we go. The premise. Let me show you these ones right here. Do do do. There we go. Patrick Swayze. Right? From Ghost and what else has he been in? Dirty Dancing. Dirty Dancing, exactly. Yeah. So the premise is those gosh darn communists, they're taking over Nicaragua, they're in Cuba, and their ultimate goal is to take over the United States of America. And if we're not, if we're not vigilant, they're going to land a force in your neighborhood. And so the premise of this, of course, is they land a force. And the, the war is looked at from the perspective of this small Midwestern town where the high school students, some of them, go up into the foothills, into the mountains, and wage guerrilla war against those Russian, Cubans, Sandinista communists, and so forth. Yeah, and here they go. And they ultimately push them back. And so, yeah. You want to see the preview? So this is definitely a movie made for the Cold War. Just like, oh, I think I'm going to clip for you later on, Rocky IV or Rocky V, I forget which one, where... Rocky goes up against the big bad uh, st steroid infused uh, Drago Russian, yeah, and so forth. Anyway, there we go. Red Dawn. Great movie. <laughs> it's so 80s. I mean, it just gives you a sense. Oh, this is the Cold War. What's the name of the high school mascot? Wolverines. Yeah. Uh oh. What's going on here, my friend? Go the enemy. Come with you, boy. Not the bus.
lot of people away. Where's my dad, Mr. Eckert? It's Marty McFly's mama. Uh-oh. Nobody manhandles baby. They want to dance with her, but they're not going to. Yeah, there you go. That is definitely, definitely, um, yeah, World War. Oh, yeah, Argo. We'll get to that one later on. Miracle. Do you believe in miracles? Anyway, but that's when we get to our longstanding, <laughs> quote unquote, ally, Iran. Mm, not quite. But we've got a little bit more to do. I want to take you through. Look, and um, uh, we're going to continue on with Backyard, CNN episode number 18, Backyard. We've covered really well the Nicaraguan aspects. What I want to say a few things uh, that are going to pop up relative to the rest of that video um, as far as other parts um, of the video and other parts of Latin America. Okay, Where the video picks up is right after Chile. Pinochet is, uh, uh, um, has taken over in Chile. Of course that was during the time of President Nixon. So then we got Jimmy Carter in there. We've already identified that Jimmy Carter has a different attitude does human rights matter? Yes, human rights matters. And probably the best example of that one where it really impacted a big change in U.S. policy is, are we going to continue supporting Samosa of Nicaragua? No. Okay? And so things had already been moving along there. We got the details. You'll see it in the video. We've actually already got it in the notes. Um, the Sandinistas will ultimately come to power in 1979, July 20th, 1979. Um, and, of course, Jimmy Carter, President Carter, invites Samosa to come, excuse me, Ortega, Ortega to come and visit the White House. But the next president, Reagan, is he cool with having the Sandinistas in charge of Nicaragua? No. And Libby, who does President Reagan support against the Sandinistas in Nicaragua? Can't you tell me? You can't? I know you can. The countries, exactly. Yeah, the countries. So here's what I want you to write down about as far as some of the neighboring countries of uh, uh, Nicaragua. El Salvador. Write this down. El Salvador, which is very close. It borders in part on Nicaragua. And they have a right-wing dictator there. And so some of the stuff that's going on down in El Salvador, some of the protesters. We got this 1979. We got protesters getting shot up by the government. <laughs> yeah, in El Salvador. Like, the United States is like, can't we just have all, like, at least neutral or perhaps friendly uh, governments down there, even if they're not necessarily fully on de democratic? This is where things kind of take a bit of a twist. Remember what I told you? What was one group, Julian, what was one group that had been in Latin America for a long time? It was an institution, and they tended to be in opposition of left-wing groups. And so sometimes, like, the right-wing groups could count on this organization, this institution, cultural institution, religious institution, hint, hint. Uh, the Catholic Church, yeah. Although, put this down, sometimes in the Catholic Church, you're going to have some Catholic leaders who look around and go, you know what, I'm going to call you, government, on your mistreatment of the people in this country. And so one of the names, you need to write this down, is the name of Oscar Romero. Oscar Romero. He's a leading Catholic in El Salvador. <laughs> I would say he is the leading Catholic in El Salvador. He was the archbishop. And he was a leading critic of the government. Basically saying, you're like killing people who are making critical remarks about your government. <laughs> so what happens if you're the prominent Catholic archbishop of El Salvador criticizing the El Salvadorian government. You get killed. Yeah, this is 1979. 1979. Yeah. 
They kill him. A death squad goes and kills him. They're like, nobody is safe. And when people show up at the funeral, you'll see the video. When people show up at the funeral in March of 1980, they get shot at as well by the military. I mean, this is brazen. Yeah, this is pretty messed up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then there's, and, and yes. I want to say in uh, early 1980. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So Oscar Romero killed in early 1980. Protesters are being shot the previous year. And then, of course, when people show up at the funeral, they're getting shot at the funeral as well. 1980, yeah. So this would have been part of whose presidency? 1980? Reagan's elected in 1980, but when does he take the oath of office? January 1981. So this is at the tail end of Jimmy Carter's, yeah. Okay. Um, in December 3rd, 1980, um, <clears throat> the government and supporters of the government of El Salvador also get some bad news because there were three nuns from the United States and another person uh, who's not a nun, but they were down there trying to help out uh, in El Salvador, and they were captured, taken into custody by the National Guard, and apparently raped and then killed and bodies dumped into shallow graves in El Salvador. So how's that El Salvadorian government's popularity doing in the American population? Not so good, yeah. All right. So will the next president, Ronald Reagan, support the overthrow of the El Salvadorian right-wing government during his administration? No, because what's the biggest issue in the Cold War? Are you with us or are you against us? Yeah. Right, so I mean, it's a difficult thing because we're like, man, cut that out, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. I mean, seriously, behave. Okay? So, Reagan has a different attitude. I'll throw this question out. I think I've said this before. Raise your hand if you can tell me. What country neighboring Nicaragua is the United States, at least in the early stages, before the Boland Amendment, in the early stages, providing weapons and support to, to help the Contras to train and to operate out of? Honduras, very good, write that down, Honduras. Okay, so we've got a lot of training and so forth going out of Honduras. That's gonna help because they share a very long border. Honduras is just to the north west of Nicaragua, yeah. No, that's okay. Okay, because oh, you've already know the answer. All right, very good. So, here was one thing, and they bring it up as well. You ready? Grenada. Write this down. Grenada. Not grenade, but Grenada. Or Grenada, I don't know how, what the correct pronunciation is. This is an interesting little blip in American history at that time. It occurs in October of 1983. You can barely see it on the map here. See if I can find it. Oh, there it is. It's just sort of off the north coast of Venezuela. I mean, it's like, I mean, if Cuba's close to the United States of America, Grenada is probably about as far away as a Caribbean island is. But in October of 1983, there's a left-wing government in Grenada. And they're starting to expand the airport runway. What would be a concern about a really extreme left-wing government expanding its runway? Large planes being able to land and take off. And where could those large planes go? They could go to the United States, and so we're very concerned about it. And the United States decides, boom, we're going to do something about it. It's the first time since the Vietnam War that we send over troops to another country for a fight. How did the Vietnam War work out for us? Is that a clear victory? I mean, we declared victory and left, or we declared peace and left and so forth. Remember the Vietnam War syndrome? After the Vietnam War, we're like, I don't know if we should get involved and so forth. A lot of American opinion is like, I don't know, because if we get involved in some foreign part of the world, it could end up being a long, long fight. Grenada breaks the Vietnam War syndrome to a degree. Why? Because President Reagan sends in the United States military, we overthrow the left-wing government of Grenada without hardly any casualties. That's a key point. 
without hardly any casualties. It was quick. It was decisive. We got the job done. It was not a quagmire. It was not a swamp. It was not a mess that go went on and on and on. Do you understand that? So after Grenada, people are like, we can do that. We can do it. <laughs> maybe we'll do another one. I don't know, Afghanistan, maybe. Was that a quick victory? But we overthrew the Taliban government in uh, 2001. Oh, we're still at war there? 20 years later? Darn it. But it's not like Vietnam that's going on and on and on, and we're losing lots and lots and lots of lives, comparatively. But anyway, yeah, so those are going to be the uh, challenges there. Um, and then, of course, the remainder of the video talks about how the Sandinistas ultimately lose. We've got it in your notes. Mining the harbors is going to be a big deterrent to the Sandinista government. It's going to wreck their economy, and they will be dragged to the negotiating table and allow for free and fair elections in Nicaragua. In where? In Afghanistan? I'm getting senses from reading the news. I mean, Trump had already kind of gotten the process started, and I'm getting the sense from, like, the Biden folks as well that they're looking to wrap it up. Who's going to be the biggest loser in Afghanistan? Probably the national government that relies on our military financial support. Because if we pull out, then that is no longer a barrier to protect them. Yeah. And then the question is, well, uh, is that Taliban going to learn their lesson and not allow for wackos to set up training camps in Afghanistan. Of course, other people are like, well, if you want to go to different parts of the world for training camps for American terrorists, let's see. Here, here, here. I mean, there's a lot of different places and so forth. But that was the one where they trained that hit us on 9-11. Mm -hmm. And that was where we responded. We whacked them there. But sometimes, like, enemies of the United States are like whack-a-mole. It's, it's a challenge. It's tough being the number one country in the world for freedom. We try to set good examples on a regular basis of like what matters. Okay, yeah. So anyway, let's go ahead and uh, for the remaining, let's get back into episode number 18, Backyard. It's all about the economy. And Corona, well, we're starting to get vaccines. I might get vaccinated by the end of next month. Pause. Jimmy Carter obviously interviewed for this uh, series. It was done about years ago, still alive, although his health is not great. He, they already announced that he was not going to be attending the inauguration, although I think he did. He was there for the one four years ago uh, for Trump, but I think health considerations have said so he's not going to be in attendance. Okay. U.S. ambassadors were used to a different role. In the 1930s, U.S. Marines had put the car Chacho Somoza in power. More than 40 years later, Nicaragua was still ruled by a Somoza. A politically moderate newspaper owner, Pedro Joaquin Chamorro, dared to challenge the dictatorship. So what happened to this person who wanted to free him? Well, they murdered him. Who murdered him? The Somoza. Chamorro's murder electrified the cowed people of Nicaragua. Somoza declared a state of siege. The U.S. woke up to popular anger against the super-rich family, which had been its ally for more than four decades. I have been fighting the East-West ideological war since the inception of Fidel Castro. So we've been under the attack of that Cuban government for almost 18 years. From the hills, where they had been secretly training for years, Guerrillas emerged who proudly bore the name of the 1930s anti-Yankee rebel, Sandino. But in the 
town of Esteli, Samosa's World War II U.S. tanks carried the day. Two thousand people died in what became a dead city. She's got her radio and a gun. Wow. Sandinistas will to win triumphed. Managua went mad with joy. Jimmy Carter had left it very late before abandoning the Samosas and accepting the new Sandinista government. I said to Carter, the United States had to make good the historical damage they had inflicted on our country. Our party him still includes the words Wow. We said to him that the only way to abolish that line would be for the attitude of the imperialist powers to change throughout the world. The U.S. would not be lectured to. The tide of conservatism, which was to bring Ronald Reagan to power, was rising. In Nicaragua, Somoza's land was shared out and the family's business monopolies were taken over. Land reform. Education and health care became widely available. But not everyone was happy with the revolution. All those who didn't agree with the Sandinista policies were subjected to confiscations and imprisonment. Lives were threatened. Many were murdered just for disagreeing with the Sandinista front. This sort of thing turned many Nicaraguan peasants against the Sandinista. In the shadows, opponents of the revolution plotted their revenge. Inexperienced Sandinista guerrillas struggled to run a war-torn country. What we asked for was weapons so that we could defend ourselves. That's what we asked of the Soviet Union, of the socialist countries of Eastern Europe, of the Algerians, of the Vietnamese. We sent light weapons, helicopters, mm. armored cars. Make sure you put that in there. They did receive weapons from the Soviet Union. And other military equipment. For the Sandinistas. Yeah, Sandinistas. There wasn't a large Soviet military presence, but they did have Cuban advisors. Not as big as it was portrayed in Red Dawn. Throughout Central America, protests mounted against right-wing military rule. In El Salvador, the Catholic Church had become a haven for the oppressed. That's at the funeral. On the concrete steps of the cathedral in San Salvador, the military decreed that demonstrators for human rights should be discouraged. Nothing very new for El Salvador. In a massacre in 1932, the military had killed up to 40,000 people. In 1979, the cameras were on hand to record the color of the blood. Archbishop Oscar Romero was the cautious leader of Salvadorian Catholics. When he spoke out, the reaction from the right was immediate. During the last months, the letterbox at the seminary where he had his office was full of anonymous letters practically every day with death squad emblems on them. There was one death squad called the White Hand. The White Hand, not the Black Hand, the White Hand. paper with the White Hand saying, we are going to kill you. We are going to tear you apart. In March 
March 1980, as he was saying mass in a private chapel, the archbishop was murdered by a single assassin's bullet. At his funeral, the military struck again. I only remember a bomb exploding, and then many shots being fired, and people running in all directions. It was a disaster. People running, knocking each other down, being hit by bullets. Many, many people were killed. The fact that they had murdered the Archbishop of San Salvador, who was the highest church representative, and that they had no qualms about killing him, made us all feel practically defenseless. He said either we take the struggle into the open, to the mountains, or they will kill us all here in the city. On December 3, 1980, three U.S. nuns and a woman lay worker started the long drive into town from San Salvador International Airport. On the way, they were raped and killed. Their corpses were discovered in a shallow grave. El Salvador's National Guard prompted President Carter to withdraw aid to the Salvadorian military. But within six weeks, Carter had resumed funding an army whose atrocities continued. Everything consisted of beatings, electric shocks, and rape. And he hit me naked. As soon as I was taken to the headquarters, I was undressed. My hands and legs were handcuffed. I was blindfolded so that I could not see the faces of my interrogators. In town, those suspected of being sympathetic to the guerrillas were easy prey for government forces. At night, bodies were dumped on waste ground or left on city streets. Like the Sandinistas in neighboring Nicaragua, the Salvadorian guerrillas wouldn't give up. The war damage was immense. In the United States, the new Reagan administration blamed Cuba and Moscow. What we are watching is a four-phase operation. Phase one has been completed, the seizure of Nicaragua. Next is El Salvador, to be followed by Honduras and Guatemala. It's clear and explicit. I wouldn't call it necessarily a domino theory. I would call it a, a priority target list. We'll wrap up this one at the beginning of class next time, and then we'll get into the freeze. The Cold War continues.